Please note that this virtual hike was recorded prior to the coronavirus outbreak in California. As we continue to fight the coronavirus in our state, please remember to follow these simple directions. Number one, please wash your hands frequently for at least 20 seconds. Number two, please maintain social distancing. This means remaining at home except for very essential activities. Number three, please remember to wear a face mask when you must leave the home. If we do all of these things, we can beat the virus and come out stronger. We would also recommend that all California residents remain indoors as much as possible. That is the reason we are bringing you this virtual hike to experience a bit of California's wonder from the comfort of your own home. Please enjoy. Hey everyone, this is Joseph from Lake Paris State Recreation Area. And today we're about to go on another virtual hike. Today we're going up the east side of Terry Peak and that's that mountain right there you can see behind me. And that's about a four mile hike. Today we're gonna to be talking about coastal sage scrub plants. So a lot of you guys know that a lot of people don't get too excited about plants, but here at Lake Paris, we like to very much stress the importance of plant life in addition to our animal life um, as part of the key wildlife aspects of our park. So plants in a way are more important than animals um, and certainly more prevalent because they really form the basis of our food web here in the park. So just looking around me, you guys can see tons of different types of plants, various different species. And right here, just in this view, view shed, you can see the Bernasconi Mountains in the back, this little ravine here. There's actually three different plant communities right here. Here in the foreground, we have a riparian, a little bit of a riparian community. You can see that more over here with the elderberry tree. And then in this little ravine, you go out, out of this ravine, you got more of the coastal sage scrub. And then all the way in the back, you got the green dotted Bernasconi Hills with some chaparral. And the way in the back, you got some more riparian over by the edge of the lake. So you can really tell a lot about the geography of a place just by looking at the plants. And the great thing about plants is they're always there. Animals are going here and there, but plants, they stay there. And they can give you a big clue, a big sign of what's going on in your environment, the overall health of the ecosystem that you're in. So by appreciating plants, we can come to learn more about the place that we're in, the climate, the geography, and even the animals and the human uh, interactions with that place. So we're talking about plants, the uniqueness, the importance of plants in the ecosystem, especially here in Southern California at Lake Paris. So one of the things that we want to establish is that plants, like any living things, live in relation to something else, which is to say they live in communities. They don't live always by themselves. They live in the surroundings of other living organisms, right? And that's pretty obvious. But when we look at that a little bit deeper and we expand that definition, we can look at plants and see their commonality over surrounding area or specific terrain and that's called a vegetation zone right and that's based on geography right like the hills and then climate also so weather uh, precipitation things like that and here where we're standing right now i picked this spot because this is a great example of what we call coastal sage scrub or really particularly riversidian sage scrub and it's really characterized by these small bushes and other scrubby plants that are about three to four, maybe five feet high, kind of sparse, spread out. And uh, they don't require a lot of water, which is good because as you guys know, we don't get a whole lot of rain here in this part of the Inland Empire, right? And as you guys may have heard in the title, coastal sage scrub, well, we're pretty far from the coast. However, it still has enough coastal influence here to be under that larger umbrella term, right? Um, mostly from the fog, from the kind of morning uh, fogs that we get here, the precipitation, the humidity that's in the air more often here than say if you go out to Victorville or even to Cabazon, we have a lot more humidity in our air here, which is a coastal influence. So hence the name coastal sage scrub. Now the other, we call a little more particularly a river sidian sage scrub. That's just a little drier and there's a different member of plant communities, uh, plants that live here compared to regular coastal sage scrub, which is what you'll find in Los Angeles, Griffith Park, um, San Diego, Orange County area. So river sidian sage scrub, as, it name, as its name implies, means that there must be a sage involved somewhere. And this is it right here. 
This is one of the sages that it's named for, probably the most common one at Lake Paris. This is the white sage. So the white sage is actually a member of the same family that basils are a part of, and rosemary, mints, things like that, and it gives off a really strong scent. And that strong scent helps other animals to stay away from it so it, it doesn't get eaten, especially in the dry seasons. So right now, we are in a transition season. Um, we should have gotten more rain by now. Normally we get more rain, but this, these stalks right here, these will grow pods and will drop out beads eventually, and those will populate new plants. So this is what this plant community vegetation zone is named after. This entire, you could even call it an ecosystem, is the white sage. However, right next to it is something that people often get confused by because of the similar smell I wish you guys could smell this right now, but this is the California sage scrub, or the California sage, I should say. The California sage is actually not related very closely to the white sage. It's in a completely different genus. However, it has similar characteristics. It has that aromatic, very strong smell to keep animals from eating it. Um, however, unlike the white sage, this plant will completely lose all of its leaves come summertime in order to conserve water. Finally, the most common plant at Lake Paris is this one right here, the brittle bush, or Encelia farinosa, as it's known in Latin. The Encelia farinosa is found uh, all over California's deserts, and here in Lake Paris, they really get to large sizes in their range. So they're found in Palm Springs, all the way out to Barstow, even into Arizona. Uh, Victorville area, but because we have the most rain or among the highest amounts of rain of anywhere in their range They really get to large sizes here. So this is a pretty small one But there's lots of other examples of the brittle bush in our park It's actually the most common plant and it's a member of the sunflower family So each of these little beads as you see at the top of these pods these will turn into sunflowers It'll grow new ones But these were old sunflowers and each one will hold hundreds of little seeds that will be dispersed mainly by the wind but also by birds eating them and then dropping them across the land. So pretty much as far as you can see from this view shed, especially on the hills, you're gonna see things covered with Encelia farinosa, the brittle bush. And it's got a lot of really neat adaptations as well. It has taco shaped leaves that are gonna help it take in less sunlight and hence preserve energy. It's gonna drop some of its leaves to preserve water. It's just got some really neat things that it does in this community. So one of the questions I think that's fair to ask is, uh, what is protecting and respecting plants in it for me? Uh, what do I get out of it? Um, and while that may seem like a kind of selfish thing to, to say, let's explore that a little bit. Um, so aside from their beautiful uh, aesthetic nature and their way to help animals and help us appreciate the natural world and learn more about ourselves, plants really help us in modern society for three main things. Number one, they perform carbon sequestration. So that's really just a fancy way of saying they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they take it into the ground, out of the atmosphere, into the ground. So here in the 21st century, and for the last about 150 years, humans have been putting up lots and lots of carbon uh, dioxide into the air through the burning of fossil fuels and the burning of plants, right? So the way that plants get their energy is they use sunlight, and they produce a chemical reaction with that carbon dioxide to produce energy. And the off product is oxygen. But while they're doing that, they're taking that carbon that's in the air, taking it into themselves, and also putting it back into the ground. Why, why is that a good thing? Well, it keeps carbon dioxide out of the air, which is good for climate change and global warming, because having too much carbon dioxide in the air allows for the sun's heat to stay on the earth longer. So really, plants are a great way to combat climate change in that way. Now, another thing that's important for them, uh, for us, number two, is that plants help keep the soil stable. So. I think a great example of this is if you guys look down to San Diego and the La Jolla area, kind of these real nice homes over the beach. What people have done is they've built these great big houses and they've stripped these natural hillsides of coastal sage scrub and they've put non-native plants there, garden plants, things like that. And what happens when it rains or they water the soil too much to keep their non-native plants alive is that it produces this real kind of sloggy, sloshy slope that you can't see until it's too late, and oftentimes those cliffs crumble into the ocean. Another example is after a wildfire, you can see how areas are very vulnerable to uh, mudslides. And finally, the third thing, guys, 
is wildfire protection. So most people don't know, but our local plants are actually supremely adapted for wildflower, wildfire resiliency. So uh, when you guys hear that forest fires um, are really bad because of uh, bad forest management, some of that's true, but a lot of it is just because humans are lighting fires or unintentionally starting fires at bad times of the year. And we've introduced non-native plants, which aren't adapted to our native cycle of weather. So you guys, you can see all the way around me, we've got a lot of native plants, but also some non-native plants. So these dead ones right here, these are examples of non-native plants. These are mustard that have gone dead for the year, right? And so these are easy uh, things to start a wildfire if it were dry. Now something like this, is the California sage. This is gonna be a little more resilient. It's gonna keep some more greenery on its leaves and be harder to start. But some non-native plant like this, this is gonna certainly start a fire a lot easier. So our native plants help give us more fire resilience, whereas the non-native plants, they're gonna be a little more flammable. So we wanna to remember to conserve the native plants um, because they're gonna help us in uh, fighting wildfires. So carbon sequestration, uh, soil stability, and wildfire resiliency are some things that uh, plants have that uh, help us out. All right, everyone, we are here now at the summit of Terry Peak, and this is the final stop of the day. We've got a fantastic views behind me. I'll turn it around so you guys can see just a little bit, right? And uh, just cl close up on our plant theme of the day. You guys may notice ever so slightly that there's actually been a change a little bit in the plant community here. So let's look around. So if we look around, we'll see that some of the plants have gotten bigger and there's different kinds of plants as well. So here we have a sugar sumac. We have an elderberry back there. Down here, we've got some more sumac, some chamais. Um, and then the plants are growing closer together and there's more greenery. And that's because we are on the north side of Terry Peak right now. And that is because in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun's rays most forcefully fall upon the southern aspects of slopes. And on the northern aspects or the northern angles of mountains and slopes, there tends to be less sunlight and less evaporation. So this picture demonstrates this in a really dramatic way. As you can see, the pine forests are growing very thickly on the northern slopes of these mountains. And on the southern side, you have mainly grasslands and brush. This is a similar dynamic that's happening here on Terry Peak. With vegetation that's more similar to what we experience in Southern California, we see here that there are two different types of vegetation. On the left side of the picture, we have chaparral, which is densely packed together, larger, thick, evergreen bushes that require more water. And on the, the right side of this picture, or the south southern slope, we have sage scrub, which is really dominated by one species here, which appears to be the California sage. It's smaller, more dry deciduous plant, which means it's going to lose its leaves in the uh, summertime. And then finally, this is another great example of one of our local mountains in the San Gabriel Mountains. As you can see again on the left side of the picture, we have these thick subalpine forests that are growing on the north side, while on the south side, we have barren rocky hills dominated also by shrubs. Now, why is this? This is because the northern sides of the slopes in the northern hemisphere get less sunlight and then they can hold more water because they don't evaporate as much. And so the soils tend to have more water, the plants have more water to use, and they can grow bigger, larger, closer together, and entirely different species can thrive there. The southern slopes get more sunlight, which means the water evaporates sooner, and the plants tend to be more sparse, and they tend to be smaller. And to close up here in Lake Paris, you can see on the left side, this is an example in one of our canyons, the north-facing slope you probably guessed it, is on the left side. And we have some oak trees, sumacs, and some chamais. And so as you can see, it's kind of thicker, more packed together. And really, if you look closely in the foreground, you can even see more wildflowers. On the right-hand side, we have the southern slope. And this is gonna be dominated more by coastal sage scrub and other kinds of dr plants that like that drier soil, like the brittle bush. 
So thank you guys for joining us on this virtual hike to the summit of Terry Peak. And we hope that when all of this is over, you guys will be able to hike to the summit on your own and experience the glorious world of plants for yourselves. We would like to encourage you guys to share this with all of your friends on social media. We have Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you like this video, please subscribe to our channels and share it with friends. Lake Paris wants to keep producing more of these virtual contents as we can during the coronavirus crisis. So thank you again, everyone, and we hope you enjoyed this presentation.